Even if you rush in a rush, Brit fluoride toothpaste starts instant action against tooth decay. Brit, B R I S K, Brit. Hello, this is Fanny Luce Pupupski, better known as UPS, visiting with you from WKBCU PS Radio Studio. Today, I want to share two special stories about three women who dedicated their lives to helping others on a global scale while overcoming personal struggles and embracing the healing power of music. Some wars are external, with weapons. Some are inner conflicts. Annie Sullivan lifted herself from poverty, social isolation, physical and emotional abuse to become the teacher companion of one person, Helen Keller, who was blind, deaf, and speechless. Together, Annie and Helen helped each other overcome their inner demons and became world-renowned leaders effecting change within the complex world of disabilities. Golda Meir was a leader among people of meager beginnings, persecution, abuse, death, and forced exiles, including wandering to find new homelands. Through it all, Golda remained strong, devoted herself to helping others, was instrumental in forming a new homeland and became Prime Minister of Israel. These three women, among countless millions of persecuted, struggling, and displaced people, surrounded themselves with healing music as they journeyed toward fulfillment of their dreams. They each worked toward making a better world and finding a place where they could do the most good. Golda loved to sing, dance, and listen to music in the midst of harrowing experiences. Helen was able to feel music's vibrations through her spirit, mind, and body, healing deep within. Annie embraced music during joyful and difficult times. Music helped them to reach for joy within the pain of loss. All of us can learn from what these women and countless others have understood. We're all able to ride the waves of music's frequencies and embrace the joy of healing vibration. Annie was born in 1866 in Massachusetts. She had a rough time of it in the early part of her life. Her mother was a sickly woman, and Annie had bad eye infection, which was gradually robbing her of her sight. Because of that, and the poverty she lived in, she was terribly rebellious as a child. Her father beat her. Her mother died from tuberculosis when she was eight. That left Annie, her brother Jimmy, and her sister Mary with their father, but he abandoned all three of them two years later. Annie never learned what became of him. The best memories she had of him were the times he was jolly and agreeable, when he was drunk enough to be unworried and sober enough to be lucid. He told her stories of the little people and other tales. When Mary was placed with relatives, Annie and Jimmy were sent to the state poorhouse, the almshouse at Tewksbury, Massachusetts. Annie was too difficult to manage and too blind to be useful, and Jimmy was becoming helplessly lame with a tubercular hip. They entered the almshouse in February 1876, just before Annie's 10th birthday and her beloved Jimmy died in May. She found him in the dead house where bodies were kept until they could dig graves. 
And he stayed on for four years. She wrote, No one outside was interested in me, and I had no friends except for fellow paupers. Some had illegal behavior and diseases you're not supposed to talk about. Some were diseased babies who died. Sometimes we played with them because we didn't have toys. One of my friends there told me that they were special friends for the blind. As time went on, my desire for an education grew. To escape from that place seemed impossible, but eventually the stench rose so high that the State Board of Charities ordered an investigation. In 1880, when I was almost 15, they came. I seized the moment and flung myself toward the group. I was not able to distinguish faces because my sight was almost gone. But I knew the name of one of the visitors and kept yelling, Mr. Sanborn, Mr. Sanborn, I want to go to school. After a few eye operations and six years of school at the Perkins Institute, Annie graduated valedictorian of her class. She had learned to read with her fingers with a raised alphabet because she was almost blind. Unknown to Annie, Helen was born the year Annie entered Perkins Institute to begin her education. Just after Helen's sixth birthday, in the midst of much anguish in her home due to her horrible behavior, contact was made with Perkins to get a teacher for Helen. Annie was recommended. Annie had never taught and only had about six months to prepare herself before meeting Helen in Tuscumbia, Alabama. The rest is history. From the moment they met, even with all the turmoil of their early weeks together, Annie shared, Helen was my life purpose. We were meant to be together. Among the many ways I tried to communicate Helen, who couldn't hear, see, or speak. I used music. Sometimes I sang to her. One of my favorites was the lullaby, Hush Little Baby. Helen felt the vibrations of the tune and my singing with her hands on my throat. Helen developed into a resilient, friendly, educated, and world-renowned fundraiser for the American Foundation of the Blind. She continued her love of music and learned how to dance. It always brought a smile to her face. Helen wrote in a magazine article, Occasionally, if I am very fortunate, I place my hand gently on a small tree and feel the happy quiver of a bird in full song. Hear the music of voices, the song of a bird, the mighty strains of an orchestra, as if you would be stricken deaf tomorrow. If Golda Meir were here, she would say, Shalom Havarim. For those of you unfamiliar with Hebrew, that means Hello, friends. It also means goodbye or peace. During her life, everyone called her Golda. Many of you remember her as a strong, forceful woman. Many remember her as gentle and soft. Many of you probably don't remember her. If Golda were here, she would want to say, there's peace in Israel. Unfortunately, she would have to say, there's never been a true and lasting peace. The situation in the Middle East continues to sadden without resolution. It contains the risk of more lives of countless cultures, adults and children. 
I may not be in government anymore, but I'm never outside the suffering of people. After so many tragic wars, long drawn out discussions of disarmament are still held as though we have a choice between war and peace. Ever since Isaiah spoke of the day when swords would be beaten into plowshares, humankind has made revolutionary strides in all domains. But the sword is still in use, and many fields are still untilled for lack of the plow. I used to rejoice when a new kind of cotton was grown and strawberries bloomed in Israel. But I also remember when I was a child in Russia, about four or five years old, when I was cold, hungry, afraid, and poor. I could hear the mob on the street outside yelling angry words and hear the screams and cries of neighbors. I saw my family and neighbors fasting and mourning for Jewish people who were murdered and their homes burned. My parents begged me to eat, but even though I was hungry, I told them I wanted to stop eating like everyone else who didn't have food. I was too young to understand, but I felt connected to the nameless people who were dying. Golda took those memories with her when her family escaped to America. The voyage was full of uncertainty and danger, but her youthful determination kept her focused. She took advantage of education and became a teacher. She loved to learn and teach. She was very close to her sister Shana, who inspired her to go to Palestine. Eventually, Golda married and went to Palestine with family and friends. The voyage there was horrible. Conditions were almost unbearable. The crew was in a constant state of rebellion, and the captain committed suicide. When Golda got to Palestine, they lived and worked on a kibbutz. Once she got settled into the kibbutz, she devoted herself to fitting into the communal way of life where everything was shared. She worked hard, even fed chickens, which she hated. She preferred to cook and feed people. She thought it was a joy to feed people, and the next best thing to chatting was eating, singing, and dancing. One of her favorite memories from those days was singing folk songs after a hard day's work. The poetic words to one of the songs refreshed her spirit. There is a tree standing on the road. It is bending over. Jewish people are traveling to the land of Israel with weeping eyes. God, God, great God. Let us say the afternoon prayer. When we get to the land of Israel, there will be great rejoicing. Eventually, her interest in helping people on the kibbutz led to government involvement in Jerusalem. Golda only had two major ambitions in life. She said, I want to step out of political life a day before the people around me begin to whisper, for God's sakes, when is this old woman going to come to the decision that it's time for her to leave? We don't want to hurt her feelings. And I never wanted to live long, only as long as my mind is clear and not one minute longer. The only thing she would have changed about her life is to have stayed on the kibbutz. She thought she would have had more peace of mind. And Golda regretted that even though she and her husband remained married and loved each other, she was not successful at her marriage. Her connection to her husband was very strong, but her dreams for Israel were not his dreams. He was a more private 
and studious person. Golda felt she had to help the people of Palestine. She tried hard to be a good wife and mother, but she needed something more. Golda traveled a great deal and represented Palestine in a variety of capacities. Sometimes she left so quickly she only had time to grab her purse and get to the airport. When her children were young, family, friends, and daycare workers filled in for her when she had to be away from home. Often Gold was called stubborn. She would answer, Maybe I am stubborn. Perhaps 4,000 years of the persecution of the Jewish people has made me stubborn. Maybe my passionate desire to survive and maintain a lasting peace for all makes me stubborn. We have all been witness to too many wars. How much longer must we all wait for peace? Perhaps peace will come when people love their children more than they hate each other. When Israel became a state, we rejoiced by singing Hatikva, which reminds us of joy and pride mixed with pain. Each of you can make a difference toward peace. Since I was called the mother of Israel, I say, what any good mother would say. Shalom. Go in peace. Hopefully, these stories will give us all something to think about. Meanwhile, until next time, this is Fanny Luce Pupupski, better known as UPS, signing off for WKBCU PS. Radio Theater. Even if you rush in a rush, Brit fluoride toothpaste starts instant action against tooth decay. Brit, B R I S K, Brit.